This is what your brain looks like when you're looking at one of these. Okay, that's not true. It actually looks like this. But when you see the world in 3D, or when you're tricked into seeing 3D, your visual cortex is doing something similar. Here I have a magic eye book. This is a compilation of pictures that, when viewed correctly, reveal a hidden 3D image. In general, they're called autostereograms. I remember being very frustrated by one of these when I was a kid, but looking back on it, I think if someone would have just told me what the goal was, I would have been able to figure it out, so I'll try to be understanding when I'm explaining how to see them. In just a minute, I'll teach you why these 3D images appear and even how you can make your own, but for now, since these kinds of images are going to be all over this video, I should at least tell you how to look at them. Every autostereogram has some horizontally repeating pattern. The goal is to diverge your vision until the two adjacent parts of this pattern meet. Some people can do this on command by going cross-eyed or wall-eyed, but if that's not you, you can try putting the image close to your nose so that you see double, then slowly pulling the book away until your brain fits together the picture. Another way is, since you're on a computer screen right now, focusing on some reflection from light behind you. If you're focused on the reflection, you should be seeing double of whatever is on your screen, so from there, slowly bring your focus back to the screen, and you should be able to see the 3D illusion. Although autostereograms enjoyed some popularity from books like this in the 90s, they're usually not seen as much more than a novelty. However, the original random dot stereogram, the precursor to Magic Eye, played an important role in understanding how our brain puts together an image of our 3D environment. In this video, we're going to learn how we perceive depth. We're going to learn how these magic eye style images work and how you can program a computer to make your own. And we're also going to learn what these magnets encased in jello have to do with your sense of vision. Humans, other animals, and robots use a variety of techniques to figure out how far away objects are. It would be out of my scope to make a definitive list, but here are a few methods that play an important role in depth perception. One is perspective. Objects look smaller when they're farther away, so if your brain knows how big an object should be, it can estimate how far it is based on the size it takes up on your retina. Of course, this means you can make mistakes or be intentionally tricked if an object is an unexpected size or shape. Another technique our brain uses is known as atmospheric or aerial perspective in the art world, although many people will be familiar with distance fog in video games. Because light scatters off of air, right during the day the sky is blue, not black, distant objects will generally appear lower contrast and maybe have a blue tint. This is really only useful for comparing distances between very far away objects, but that's good because some of these other methods only work for close objects. Method number three is motion parallax, the effect that when you're moving, objects perpendicular to your motion appear to be slower when they're farther away. Humans often experience this when wearing cars, but some animals with wider fields of view use it as a primary method for depth perception. For example, one of the reasons that pigeons bob their heads is to take advantage of this effect. Astronomers also use a variation of this method called stellar parallax to measure the distance to nearby stars. If we compare a picture of the sky to another picture six months later, when the Earth is on the other side of the Sun, stars that are very far away will look the same, but close stars will move relative to the background stars. The amount they move is, of course, tiny, but it's measurable, and it allows us to calculate our distance to the closer star. Accommodation is the word we use for when our eyes adjust their lenses to focus on an object. Because objects only at one specific distance will be clear on our retina for a given lens shape, accommodation can give us depth clues. In chameleons, whose eyes move independently, it might even be the main form of depth perception. Right before a chameleon shoots out its tongue to catch prey, both of its eyes focus on the insect, so at one point, researchers assumed that they use binocular vision for depth perception while hunting. But when researchers gave them tiny glasses to blur their vision, the chameleons would overshoot or undershoot their tongue by the same amount that the glasses would have modified their vision. So it seems that accommodation is very important for 3D vision in chameleons. Finally, the one that makes us able to see these magic eye illusions, we have binocular parallax, or stereopsis. Our brain uses two similar, but not same, images from two eyes to figure out relative depth. You'll notice that this is the same word parallax as in motion parallax, and if you think about it, they're kind of the same thing. 
Instead of waiting for Earth to move to the other side of the sun, or moving your pigeon head to a different spot, we have two eyes that get the images at the same time. Just about every gimmicky way of making 3D media comes down to making each eye see something different. With the classic 3D glasses, it was two different color filters, with glasses-free stuff like the 3DS, it was a series of barriers that changes which eye sees which pixels when you're looking from a certain angle. And with modern 3D glasses, it's two different polarizations. Auto stereograms are ultimately another way of making each eye see something different. It's clear that humans use a combination of all of these techniques, so you might be inclined to assume that in order to use binocular parallax, we need other visual clues to distinguish something as an object, right? Our brain uses color and shading to find an object, and then it compares the background images from our right and left eyes. But one of the interesting discoveries about human visual perception in the last century is that as long as we have images from each eye, we don't need any context at all. For example, let's say that your left eye is looking at a completely random arrangement of black and white pixels. Take this image and select a square, or really any shape for that matter, and shift it over one pixel. You can fill in the empty space with more random pixels. If your right eye focuses on this picture while your left focuses on the original, what you'll see is the shape that we cut out floating in front of the background as if it really was 3D. If you pause the video, you'll be able to see it by using the same technique that you used to see the magic eye. The only difference is that you're trying to fuse the two pictures together instead of fusing a different repetition of the same pattern together. This is called a random dot stereogram. Again, even though both of these pictures appear to be entirely random, your brain can find complex shapes hidden inside. You can pause the video again and try this one out if you want. If you absolutely can't see it, you should get the same effect by looking at this picture through 3D glasses. I imagine you don't have red-blue 3D glasses on hand though, so maybe this will help you see it. Your brain's ability to find the difference between two images as soon as they fuse is almost a superpower, really. If you practice it, you can use this technique to immediately solve those spotted difference kinds of puzzles. Neuroscientists later came up with a way to combine the two images of a random dot stereogram into a single image auto stereogram and that evolved into the magic eye books. And they're not limited to only displaying one plane with some shape above a background, so they can show detailed 3D structures by shifting the pixels by the amount of desired depth. To create your own, start with a grayscale image called the depth map. Brighter pixels should represent parts of the image that are closer to the viewer. Then make a new empty image, and pick some number to be the width of the image before it repeats again. We'll say it's 40 pixels. For each pixel in a given row, find the brightness of that same pixel in the depth map, and subtract that from 40. Now go back that many pixels, and use the color of the pixel that's there as your new pixel's color. If you keep on going from left to right through every pixel, then do this for every row, this will create an auto stereogram of your depth map. When you're at the far left of the image, just starting the algorithm, you'll be trying to grab the color of a pixel that doesn't exist. So in this case, just pick a random color until your algorithm reaches colors that already exist. If you want to use a background image, then you can grab pixels from there instead of generating random ones. To better understand how our brain puts together the two images that it gets from our eyes, I'm going to use a model that was introduced by Bella Ulesse, the neuroscientist that pioneered most of this work on random dot stereograms. Imagine you have an array of tiny magnets, and each is free to move to whatever angle it wants. Pretend north represents a black pixel, and south represents a white pixel. Then flip over your magnets to make a picture. Once the picture is done, connect the tips of the magnets with tiny springs. This represents the image that one eye sees. Make another array of magnets for the other eye. Now when you put these two arrays of magnets next to each other, the magnets are going to freely move wherever is most convenient for them. The angle that each magnet moves to will represent the depth of that part of the image. Let me explain what I mean. Let's look at just one row of magnets. Say that both eyes see the exact same picture. In this case, all of the magnets line up perfectly, north to south or south to north, so none of the magnets will rotate, and your brain perceives that everything is at the same depth. 
Something interesting to note is that if you slide the images away from each other, the magnets will still all move to the same relative angle, so your brain can still measure depth correctly. This corresponds to making yourself see double. Your eyes always snap the images back together when you're done. Now say that you're looking at a stereogram with a square in the center, or maybe just one row of it. Just like before, the magnets on the outside will be perfectly lined up, but now there's a number of magnets that are offset from each other in the right and left eyes. All of these magnets here are going to slightly rotate to match the corresponding pixels in the other eye. That angle is the depth of the square relative to the background. You may or may not have the intuition to imagine how hundreds of tiny magnets interact with each other, so it would be nice to build a physical model of this. Ulesz, who originally studied to be an electrical engineer, also suggests replacing the magnetic dipoles with coupled oscillators, then the shifting of frequencies would correspond to rotation, but I highly doubt that that's more intuitive for anybody. The other thing he suggests is suspending a few hundred tiny magnets in gelatin. Supposedly, the jello would provide a similar coupling that the springs would. I can't find evidence that anybody's tried this before, although in all fairness, the copy of the book that I'm reading this from goes from page 210 back to page 195, and then there's a second copy of all the pages from 195 to 210, then it continues to 243, so it cuts off right in the middle of this jello discussion. I don't know if I'm missing some kind of profound conclusion. You can enlighten us in the comment section if that's the case. Here's my model of binocular vision, or my attempt at least. I made the crucial oversight that my refrigerator's shelves are made out of metal, so of course the magnets went straight to the bottom and weren't really suspended in the jello. But that's not the only problem, I just don't think this is ever going to work. Nor does it need to. I think you probably get the point by now, so we'll end it here.